Good afternoon, Westminster Woods on Julianton Creek. Chaplain Leslie here bringing you our Sunday afternoon Vesper services for today, which is not only February the 14th, it is Valentine's Day. And so as we've had our little hearts in the vase here in this last couple of weeks, we'll continue to have them throughout the month of February. And I also have a pretty pink heart today. I think it shows up pretty well against my red sweater. So I wish you, each of you, a very happy Valentine's Day today. As we begin our time together, today is also Transfiguration Sunday, uh, which is an important Sunday, uh, as you'll see in our sermon time. We are, are in Mark 9, 2 through 9 for today. And today is also the last Sunday of Epiphany, beginning uh, Wednesday of this coming week, will be Ash Wednesday, and then we will be in the season of Lent. And so this is a, a, a perfect scripture passage to begin um, and to end, to begin a time and also to end a time. And so our two hymns today, the first one will be the gift of love, which will be in honor today as Valentine's Day, but also talking about God's love as well. And then our uh, closing hymn, our hymn of sending, will be uh, Spirit of God, Descend Upon My Heart. And so I invite each of you now to center your hearts and minds for worship. Let us pray. The darkness of winter, God, has been our companion. Now the days are beginning to lengthen. Bring your light to us, that we might see your glory and may work for you, offering hope and peace to this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our call to worship, if you will follow along with me as I prompt you this afternoon. The Lord has called you here this day. Lord, reveal to us your purposes for us. Lord, reveal to us your purposes for us. Open your hearts to receive God's good news. Lord, make us ready to serve you. Lord, make us ready to serve you. O come, let us worship God. Let us sing praises to the Almighty One. Let us sing praises to the Almighty One. Amen. And so again, our opening hymn, The Gift of Love, is this is, if this is not one that is familiar to you, I hope that you will enjoy the tune. It's a beautiful uh, hymn, and it is in our hymn book. Though I may speak with bravest fire, and have the gift to all inspire, but have not love. My words are vain as sounding brass and hopeless gain. Though I may give all I possess and striving so my love profess, but not begin by love within. The prophet soon turns strangely thin. Come, Spirit, come, our hearts control. Our spirits long to be made whole. Let inward love guide every deed. By this we worship and a freed. I like that one. We come now to continue spirit of prayer. I invite you to be in that prayerful spirit and as we do we'll take a moment during our prayer time so that you at home can lift up whatever prayers might be on your heart and then we will close our time of prayer by praying the Lord's Prayer together. So I invite you again to be in that prayerful spirit along with me. Let us pray. Lord of infinite mercy, we would make a Broadway production of this transfiguration event because we would 
not take the time to understand its significance for our lives. We're in such a hurry to memorize and memorialize everything that the power and meaning of the event become pale or altered in our memories. Help us look at Jesus with new eyes, those eyes that see him in light of the witness of the ages, that see Jesus as the one who comes to set people free, to heal, to bring hope and peace. Make us ready to become faithful disciples rather than remaining dazzled by the mountaintop experience. Give us strength and courage this day to witness to Jesus' love by the many deeds of mercy and justice we can offer in his name. For we ourselves offer all that we have. Though we are imperfect, we are willing to serve. God, I pray for each person here today that as we seek to be your servants, that in those places in our lives when we are in pain, when we are worried, where we are in fear, that you hear our prayers from the very depths of our heart. We ask that you hear in this quiet moment, too, additional needs now. And as you hear all that's on our hearts today, Lord, the, the things that weigh us down, the things that perhaps we are grateful for and thankful for on this day that we celebrate, all of those we give to you. And as we do so, may we now pray the prayer that you taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture, as I mentioned at the beginning of our time together, is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. So hear these words from Mark. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had been risen from the dead. May God add his blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of his holy word. I imagine that amongst each of you, if not maybe all of you at some point in your life, maybe now, you are doing some genealogy, researching your family tree. And I've done that a little bit on my own and have had other family members do that as well. And you see names of people long gone and you can't help but wonder the kind of people that they were. Was my mother's father, Grandpa Jay, Jay Marple, a righteous man? I know that my grandma Marple was. She was a God-fearing woman her whole life. How about my great-grandparents? Eleonora and Cassius Marple were their names. Or my great-great-grandfather, Ezekiel Marple, and his wife, Caroline. Some of my relatives came from Germany. Some came from England. Maybe other places that I don't even know about. What was that like to immigrate to this country? To make a life, a new life, a different life? hopefully a better life for your children. Genealogy can take you all different ways, twists and turns throughout, but 
part of the fascination for me is how two people can find one another and get married and have children and how those children can find more people to be married and have children and on down through multiple generations until I am here today. That amazes me. To be able to talk to those people from my past. Someday in heaven, I will have those conversations. But for now, they are imaginations for me because those people are long gone. And through pictures and maybe family stories, I get an inkling of who they were, but not as much as when I can see them again one day. How we connect to our past through our ancestors is one way that we can come to understand ourselves as human beings and also as Christians. When Peter, James, and John saw Jesus standing on that mountaintop with Elijah and Moses, it was a little bit of a family reunion of sorts, but I'm sure that it felt much more to them. Because Moses and Elijah, as we know, were pillars of Jewish history. They represented the law, Moses did, and Elijah represented the prophets, and their voices had not been heard for generations. The prophet Malachi, some call him the last prophet of Israel, wrote at the end of his book, Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws that I gave him at Horeb for all to hear. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. These final words, these final instructions for the Jewish people came some 400 years before Christ was born, yet they still held true 400 years later and even into today. Peter, James, and John find themselves on that famous mountaintop with Jesus at the Transfiguration, and apparently Moses and Elijah, of all people, were also there. At least that's who they believed that they saw. Moses brought the law of the God to the Israelites who were instructed to keep them. And those laws were to continue, not be discarded through the generations. They were part of the foundation of their faith. Elijah is the greatest of prophets, is noted by Malachi to come again. Some scholars say he comes through the spirit of John the Baptist, the one who came to preach repentance and baptism. So who they were and their roles in biblical history impacted the disciples and I think are part of our history as well. These intentional references in Mark and also the other gospel writers to Moses and Elijah serve, as some scholars say, to present a place where if you can envision both past and present come together. How does this place of past and present speak to the disciples? Well, poor Peter, goodness, bless his heart, so overwhelmed, he feels he needs to do something to honor the presence of these most important and powerful figures. James and John appear to be silent, maybe trying to puzzle through what it is that they're witnessing. Even when the experience draws to a conclusion, the disciples keep the matter to themselves, Mark says. What are they to make of the experience? Does it confirm, perhaps, for them the identity of Jesus? And then to hear God's instruction for them. To hear that voice of God must have been beyond words. Well, what about the instructions from Jesus to not tell anyone what they had witnessed until he had risen from the dead? The disciples had been told what would be happening, but... Too much, I think, for their hearts to comprehend just yet. Peter doesn't want to believe in the verses just ahead of today's lesson that Christ is going to die. He tells Peter that he's thinking like a man, not as one who has the Spirit of God upon him. So as the disciples struggle with this most extraordinary experience, their past comes square against their present and crashes into it, in essence, and also begins a notion of what their future is going to look like. Jesus has indeed come to preach, teach, and heal. We've been talking about that for the last several weeks. But he's also come to die. And that is something that cannot be lost. Die, yes, but also to be resurrected in order that death, that death not be the final word. I get the sense that Jesus wants him to know that 
even when he's no longer with them, they will have one another. Their past will be part of them to guide them, and the Spirit of God will direct them. They will never be alone. I don't think Jesus is asking them to forget their past. Rather, what their past has helped to shape them to be the people that they are, and certainly the world that they know. You know, at the same time, I think Jesus is asking them to see the world in a bigger way through God's eyes, not their own so much. A better world, a world capable of peace and love and harmony. So in the mystery of this mountaintop experience for Christ and the disciples, how about we explore how the past, present, and future speaks to us? I said earlier it would be something if I could have a conversation with one of my ancestors to find out maybe what their dreams had been, to know what legacy they hoped to leave to their children, if they ever imagined what future generations of marbles might look like and how they might make an impact in the world. I think in the Transfiguration story, we have an opportunity to connect with the law and the prophets of our past, to be reminded that the law of God still applies to us today, still the foundation of our faith as it was for the disciples and the very first of God's people. That the word of the prophets wasn't just empty and fleeting, that they held truth and still hold truth today. 400 years without a word from the prophets until Jesus comes naturally makes us wonder if those words are still valid. But in Malachi, we are reminded of that. While the past is important because it sets the stage for us today, Christ is certainly and unquestionably the present and future along with the disciples. Christ is the new creation and is the new covenant for God's people. We hold the past in our hearts, but we are also called to move forward as well. For the disciples faithfully following Christ, despite the questions that they had, must have been a challenge. They are processing what they have witnessed. All of Christ's baptism, his preaching, his calling of the disciples, all the healings that he had been doing in these last weeks, the miracles that have happened. On this last Sunday before Epiphany, we find ourselves at the beginning of a new season, a season of Lent, a time where we will have an opportunity to explore our own hearts and pray that God will create a new and clean heart within us. And as we begin that preparation for following Christ to the cross, the mountaintop experience is a great place. A place of endings and a place of new beginnings as well. As we embrace our personal family trees, Scripture calls us to embrace our biblical family trees as well. And the past of each of us here at Westminster Woods impacts today, the present, and also will impact our future. We take our strengths from God. The same God who has enabled us to build, and we seek not only to envision what the future holds, but to step into it with enthusiasm, with God leading the way. Amen. God, I pray that your word carries with us in this week that mountaintop experience, that we hold it in our hearts as we approach the season of Lent. Amen. Our hymn of sending, I'll share the first verse with you all is Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. Wean it from earth, through all its pulses move. Stoop to my weakness, mighty as the Lord, and make me lovely. As I ought to love. And now for our benediction. Cry out. God's word has been spoken. Cry out. Our hearts are filled with praise. Cry out. Our lives proclaim God's glory. Cry out. The bounty of God's love. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen, good people of Westminster Woods. Again, I pray a blessing upon you and have a lovely Valentine's Day. Until next time, peace. <laughs>